Hello everyone, today is the 7th of September 2024 and this is going to be the second talk on the um, going back, we're going to go back to the first century, the years between the year 33 after the death of Christ and the year 70, uh, the destruction of the temple. It's going to be not an easy time for either Jews or Christians. And uh, I am following here again Father Javier Harbesi um, in his lectures. He's a Catholic priest, he's a historian, and he's a uh, lawyer too, but he, he gives lectures in many, many subjects, and uh, but they are in Spanish, so I'm... I'm, I'm as I explained to you in the first video, I am following him and trying to summarize as much as I can. And this second uh, post is going to be on that period. Uh, and we're going to call it the church and the synagogue. Remember in the first video, I told you that uh, I will put it at, right at the end of the video, by the way, for those who see this one for the first time, that we talked about how the Greco-Roman world was actually quite ready in culture to hear uh, about uh, this new religion. Yes, we we accepted that the... Um, the whole of the faith, it was revealed to the Jewish people, the chosen people. And as a metaphor, we said that it came to them fully revealed with Jesus um, uh, as a cascade, uh, as a torrent. But in the Greco-Roman world, uh, it was more like that thing thread that trickle of pure water of the river meander you remember but the point was that because of the myths in that greco-roman world because everything was explained history everything was explained through myths that they didn't that they were almost ready to hear what the apostles had to preach in other words if and I gave you the example, um, was Ulysses a man? And I said, mm, yes and no. Yes, he was a man, but he was more than a man. He was a hero. And a hero was the offspring of a god, an immortal, or a goddess, an immortal. So Ulysses, this in this particular case, was had a second nature. He was divine and he was human. And so many other examples, the virgin birth and so on. So when Paul goes to Athens, he doesn't, the people didn't find it all that strange. They were almost ready. You, mem you remember the parable of the sower who went around sowing uh, seeds at random and some fell on fertile ground the Jewish people, and some fell in rocky ground, and some fell amongst uh, thorns. Yeah, so um, they were ready to hear it, and we. They didn't find a great difficulty understanding it. You remember Saint Paul when he is telling them about Christ and the divine nature. They were saying, "Yeah, okay, so." <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it was only when he started talking about the resurrection, because it, it wasn't in any of the myths, that they suddenly said, OK, uh, up to here, you know, let's uh, get up and uh, go and have a cup of coffee somewhere, because we thought that he was serious, and now it turns out that he is a little bit of a charlatan anyway, OK? So we covered all that in the first video. So now we are going to talk about these first years, okay, of they weren't easy. They weren't easy, as, as you might uh, imagine. But um, you see, what happened after Christ died? 
the apostles and his disciples, but the apostles especially were terrified, terrified because they knew that they were next, basically. And they gathered together, and uh, they were there sort of hiding under the bed sort of thing, okay? So um, fearful, scared, frightened, the Virgin was there too with them. And then what happens we hear is Pentecost, 50 days after the, uh, the uh, crucifixion. Uh, the Holy Spirit, what we call Pentecost, descended, sacred scripture says, descended upon them. And whatever happened, something happened because these very frightened men all of a sudden became courageous. They were, they were not hiding anymore. Off they went preaching the good news to everybody. Something had changed. They were from frightened little, uh, you know, uh, people there hiding away. They went out and they were actually saying things to the Jews, to their people, straight away saying, you know, repent, you have killed the Messiah. I mean, this was, this was harsh. This was, you know, they were there. So, um, this uh, uh, Pentecost, uh, that we, what we call Pentecost, this actually coincided um, more or less with uh, uh, a, um, a festivity, a celebration in the Jewish tradition, which was called the Day of the Tabernacles. It was a Jewish feast, perhaps one of, one of the most important. And... Um, what happened was that, okay, the, the Jews at the time were, um, they didn't all live in uh, Israel or Palestine, and they were dispersed. There was a diaspora there already. The uh, historian, the Jewish historian Josephus, who um, we are going to follow here uh, with the destruction of the temple, he was uh, alive and uh, um He's going to tell us what happened in great detail, as a matter of fact. But he says that in 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 the known world, there was there was hardly any city where you would not find Jews there. They were dispersed already. And but in any case, at the time of the 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 festivity of the day of the tabernacles, they would come to Jerusalem to celebrate that day. Many of them coming from different parts of the world, coming from different cultures, they would speak different languages. They had, many of them, uh, different cultures, different traditions. Um, actually, there was, uh, Jesus actually reproached them at one time. He said um, to these Jews who had adopted strange traditions. Uh, he said, uh, Jesus reproached them. Uh, he said, you have transformed the religion of our father and made it a religion of men in the traditions of men. This was probably referring also to the Kabbalah, the Hebrew Kabbalah, where it's based on ancient traditions that the Jews were adopting and had been adopted. Um, from other cultures, from the times of captivity. Um, but uh, in spite of all being, you know, spread all over the known world, nevertheless, at certain uh, uh, festivities, they would come to Jerusalem. And uh, what, let me see. Okay, so... And so the apostles by now had gained some confidence and courage and so on. They were preaching to all of them. And we hear them, we hear the people saying, but were not these people those Galileans? I mean, how, how come that they can speak all those languages? Um, 
different languages that everyone could understand. In fact, they were not speaking different languages. It's, it's that they were hearing it in their own language. Uh, in other words, uh, the miracle was a, a passive miracle. The, the apostles were not speaking in different languages. They were understood in their own languages. Um, so, uh, what is going to happen is that uh, they start preaching and they start um, uh, doing miracles. For example, the first one, St. Peter, is uh, that of the paralyzed man. Uh, he was actually asking for alms. And Peter said to him, uh, I, I, I have nothing, but what I have, I will give to you in the name of Jesus Christ. He said, get up and walk. And he did. And people saw this. So there was a lot of commotion there because people were actually converting. But the people who were converting were all Jews. Yes, the Gentiles, they, no one was thinking of, 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 of going yet to the, to, the, to the Gentiles, to the pagans out there. The first Christians, and the word is not used, the, the word Christian, until uh, a later incident in Antioch. I'll tell you about it. But uh, at this time, they were all uh, Jews who were converting. That means accepting that... Uh, Jesus Christ was the Messiah, and so on. So, so um, but very soon, there are going to be divisions among them. And one of the main ones was, there were two main ones. One was precisely that. Could we accept pagans and Gentiles into this religion. Um, what had the Gentiles got to do with anything? This is our religion, okay? Uh, we continue to be Jews. There is nothing contradictory. We keep the, uh, the, the rituals and the rites and the, and the faith of one God, one true God, creator of heaven and earth, and there was there was nothing that was that they felt was going against the religion they they were Jews and they felt that they were Jews and there was nothing that they could say no to the only difference is that they actually believed that Jesus Christ had been the messiah as the prophets had prophesied but that doesn't mean that they're not Jews they continue to be Jews so what are the gentiles i mean it's like you know, why should they be just waltzing in <laughs> and taking our religion and our and our Messiah? They, there was this, this sense, okay? One section. The other section was, well, but this is new. This is new because Jesus said, go out and baptize and uh, teach my teachings to the four corners of the world. In other words, it's not this new religion, it's not just for one people, for one race. It's for the whole world. So there is something new here. But this was this was a real argument. You know, it, 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 it I can understand both sides because you can you can you can see that the the, the converts didn't want to to give up um, what they felt was theirs, okay? And they're going to be called the particularists and the universalists, if you can, uh, <laughs> you, you, you get it, right? So, so the, um, so, so uh, one section, the particularists wanted really to continue with all the Jewish rites and all the Jewish traditions, okay, and the uh, the uh, um, and and the rites, the circumcision, the, the rules about food and so on, okay. Um, so uh, 
The other, as I said, was no salvation comes to everyone who is open to receive the faith and believes anyone. So, but even if we accept that we can open it up to the Gentiles and the pagans, shouldn't they really, before they become Christians, although the word wasn't used yet, but uh, before they become Christians, shouldn't they really become Jewish first? In other words, before they, they would have to come through this stage of believing in our religion and then accepting that the Messiah had come, not just go from, from paganism to Christianity. They couldn't accept that. They found it very, very difficult. So the first Christians, all Jews, okay, were at the crossroads here. Okay, the ones who wanted to continue with the Jewish rites and the other ones who said no. There is something new here. Jesus asks us to go in his name after his death and resurrection and ascension. So, um, all right. The thing about the particularists and the thing that had to be sorted out was that they believed that, okay, they were Jewish and there was a particular particular thing about being Jewish, you were of the Jewish race, that was a Semitic, and you were born of a Jewish mother, okay, and that was a, a that was extremely important. You have to be Jewish to be saved. Um, so that was, they wanted to preserve it to the people of Israel only us, okay? Uh, the others obviously said no, 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 it's not, it, this is, this is, this cannot be the only thing that you're born from a Jewish mother or you are of, uh, uh, from, from uh, a David lineage. Um, um, the Messiah has come for the whole world. Okay. So, this tendency uh, or this section, the universalists that believe that it should be open for everybody, <clears throat> were mainly Jewish people who were from other parts, uh, from Alexandria in Egypt, who was very, very closely linked at the time culturally with Greece and other parts of the world, they were the ones who actually opted for opening it up to everybody. Um, but even if you required that they would become Jewish first, it was, they would never be completely Jewish because they had this, um, they were called the, the, um, proselytes. <clears throat> the proselytes were people who converted to Judaism, okay, but could come to the temple, but could only cross up to a point to, to the to the to the first doors of the temple and then they had to stay there. That could they could go no further. Okay, because they were not quite Jewish in all its plenitude, so they were excluded from the complete rites. Of course, they had their duties and their beliefs, uh, uh, but um, one true God and uh, observing the Sabbath and uh, contributing to the maintenance of the synagogue and the temple. But uh, they were a little bit a kind of second class because they were not really, had not been born of a Jewish mother and they were not of the Jewish race. So they, they could come into the rites, but up to a point, up to a point, up to the door of the temple. Um, all right, um, this is, you remember in the Catholic Church, or, well, yes, in the first uh, hundreds year, hundred years of Christianity, 
uh, we had something different, and that was that the catechumens would be, in other words, the people who had not yet been baptized or had been baptized but were still uh, in a process of instruction would only be allowed to come to the Mass, yes, but they were only allowed to stay. They could hear up to the um, the Epistle and the Gospel and then the homily, the sermon, but then they would leave. They couldn't stay when the offertory started and the consecration because they were not ready yet to partake of that. So we probably inherited that from the proselytes at the door, the door proselytes from, from the Jewish tradition. Okay, so now what is going to happen in the meantime too is that the first persecutions of these converts is going to begin. I'm not talking yet about the persecutions of, 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 that the Romans did for centuries, but these are from the uh, elders and from the councils and the Sanhedrin um, that were beginning to worry about these people who were going around preaching this new doctrine. Um, and so we have the first persecutions. They were ready to arrest them and send them to prison. And one of the elders, the Pharisee, a rabbi, uh, intervened on the side of the apostles, actually. He, uh, he told them um, when he wanted to, when they wanted to send them to prison, he said to them, this is all in the Acts of the Apostle, okay, the Apostles, the New Testament. And he told them, uh, if this is not of God, it will quickly disappear, this new movement. But if it is of God, we would be fighting against God if we persecute them. If you read it in Acts 5, you see that he gives them example. Look, this thing about the Messiah, we have been through this before. There have been others before who have called themselves the Messiah. And look what happened to them. They lasted five minutes and then they disappeared. So um, don't go overboard. You know, if it's not, as he says, if it is not of God, it will die off anyway. But... Um, Time will pass, and the the uh, uh, they they are called in to explain themselves. They scourge them first, but then they say they let them go. They don't send them to prison, and they said, "Do not speak about this man Jesus." And so, and the apostles continue. They are totally unafraid now. So, um, and and. And and the, and the fact is that they were saying things like, "Repent, you have killed the Messiah." I mean, things like that on <laughs> on their face. So obviously there is going to be a problem. And now they're sensing the elders are sensing that this is not perhaps a passing thing as we thought. This is going to create a problem. So the first. The first persecution. I'm going to talk about the first persecutions of the Christians first, okay? And then I am going to uh, go back to, in other words, what was happening in the Christian community of converts and how they finally decided to, yes, extend the the preaching to the Gentiles. And then at the end, I will talk about what happened to the Jews themselves, which will end up with the destruction of the temple in the year 70. So just to give you an idea of what is going on, the persecutions start, okay? And the first one is that of Stephen. And we celebrate Saint Stephen on the 26th of December, the the day after Christmas, being the very first one. Stephen was actually a learned man, a cultured man. 
perhaps of Alexandrian origin in Egypt, yes. He knew very well his faith. He knew very well the Jewish traditions. Uh, but he had acknowledged the Messiah. And that was a little bit of a problem. <laughs> and But nevertheless, the learned people would debate him, okay, and he would not budge. He continued and would debate with them. So now he is considered, he's going to be considered an enemy. And you can read what happened to him in Acts uh, 6. Um he was then, they didn't know what to do with him quite, and so they got some false witnesses who say, and it's very interesting to read it, but I mean, just summarizing, they say, this man speaks against the holy places and against the law, and we have heard him say that this uh, Jesus of Nazareth will destroy this place and change all the traditions that Moses has given us. And, and so they accuse him. And there is a, a defense that he, Stephen defends himself. And actually he says, you are angry, you uh, hard-headed, you have always resisted, he says, you have always resisted the Holy Spirit as your fathers before you, you also now. What prophet did your fathers not persecute? Put to death those who in advance announce the coming of the just one, whom you have now betrayed and murdered. This is the way he would speak, well... <laughs> You can imagine there is a problem here. Anyway, he was stoned to death. And uh, he's um, there watching the whole thing is a young man called Saul. Uh, Saulo. St. Paul. Yes, he perhaps passively, but he cooperated. He would hold the garments of those who were stoning him. So this is going to be a... Uh, trigger is the first one. Um, the uh, Pharisees and the Sadducees, these were rabbis or elders, members of the council, um, will meet in Jerusalem to actually put a stop to this new doctrine. Um, and um, this, uh, this persecution of this um, killing of Stephen uh, actually was a trigger point because many of those converts now went away. Uh, they they dispersed, they went to Judea and Samaria and Phoenicia, all Semitic-speaking peoples. Um, in the uh, Levant, where is now Lebanon, to Cyprus, Syria, um, the prophecy perhaps of Jesus being fulfilled, you will be my witness in Jerusalem and in the whole of Judea, Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. This is in Acts 1. Um, another example was the uh, Samaritans. They went to the land of the Samaritans to, to preach. Well, the Samaritans were very much looked down upon by the Judeans. And this, you remember in, in the Gospels, the Samaritan woman, yes. And the disciples were so uh, astounded at the fact that Jesus was speaking to a woman and a Samaritan woman at that. Uh, because they were considered, uh, well, practically subhuman dogs perhaps um, because they had mixed the Jewish customs and paganized them and uh, they were considered heretics basically now a, a companion of Stephen was Philip and he is going to go to Samaria to announce the gospel to them and this, for the Jews, was really a scandal. 
they they absolutely hated the Samaritans. Uh, but many would convert to Philip to 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 his words and accept baptism. Um, but um, there is a um, there is an episode, for example, of a um, someone who uh, Philip um, baptized. And he was a, um, a an official from Ethiopia, a minister of the Queen of Candace. The, uh, the Queens of Candace were, were a title that was given to all the queens, and uh, then the Queen Mother. But anyway, it was it was he was a mini minister of a queen. We're not sure whether he was Ethiopian. It seems that he. He was from what we now would call the Sudan, but in any case, okay. So he is—he would be one of these proselytes who would have to stay back at the door, yes. And he is there uh, reading scripture, and uh, Philip actually uh, almost pro provoked him a little bit. Uh, he asked him directly. Um, do you know, do you understand what you're reading? And he answered more or less, how can I understand what I'm reading if no one explained it to me? And Philip looks at where he's reading and it is Isaiah and he explains to him the good news and he converts and uh, in a little sort of stream, uh, nearby stream, he is baptized. So this is the thing that they're doing all over the place. Okay. Then, of course, uh, we have the the apostles who then just go and spread the world's James and all right. So, but going back to that division that we were talking about um, between the Jewish people and the the Jewish world and the Christian world is going to become uh, an event is going to take place that is going to be extremely important actually transcendental um, again according to the Acts of the Apostles and this happened in the city of Caesarea in Palestine that a centurion, a Roman centurion called Cornelius actually has a vision that or a dream that tells him to go to um, a city by by the sea I think they mentioned this the city and to 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 speak to one uh, Cephas or Peter um, and he there is something that he has to hear from him. He sent his servants. Peter comes in and talks about the faith to him and he converts. Now this is going to be a major problem and is going to be a source of a lot of arguments and divisions because this Cornelius was a Gentile, he was a pagan, and so how could he, Peter, baptize him and allow him to come in? The situation hadn't been resolved yet. So, um, let me just hold on a second. Yes, so after you know, 2000 years of Christianity, we might not be fully aware of, um, you know, the, the division here, the importance of, of sorting this thing out. Because, but put yourself uh, in, in the place of a Jew uh, who hears that a pagan like Cornelius can be saved and have eternal life like he can have that. It was a very foreign notion, and 
this was uh, very difficult to accept. It was a little bit too much. So anyway, Cornelius is baptized. And at that time, if you baptized a leader, you also, all your followers, all the people uh, under you also became baptized. Um, they couldn't accept that you could become a Christian without being Jewish first. And this was major. So by what Peter did, that meant that you could actually become Christian without being Jewish first. It was a major uh, event, this. From that moment, you... Um, what happened was that they began to see themselves as the beginning of a division between Jews and Christians, as it were, that they no longer saw themselves as a sect of Israel, as a sect of the Jewish religion, but began to see themselves as something different, something new, with that basis, but different. And that was a major step. So uh, Peter um, was then accepting people who came directly from paganism. From that moment on, the church, as I said, would no longer be a sect of Israel, an isolated group, separated from the Jews, but something new, something, you know, that from then on would be universal for everyone. Remember the words of St. Paul, um, for God, you know, uh, no, Greek, no Jew, no, no Greek, no man, no woman, rich or poor, f uh, free man or slave. Uh, in other words, not just for a specific type of person, no more that. It, that mission of Israel, therefore, had ended and as the only people of God. That was a major step. It was not only for Israel and the Jews to be the chosen people. It would be now extended to the whole world. The church, therefore, saw itself as the new spiritual Israel. As a matter of fact, sometimes it would call herself the new Israel in a spiritual way. That's why in so many medieval cathedrals, actually, instead of seeing, for example, the rose windows there, you will find actually the Star of David in these medieval cathedrals and um, and and you and you wonder what what is the star of david doing in a medieval catholic cathedral it is this the new israel the spiritual israel in other words the promises made to israel are now given to the church of the christians and at that time obviously the the the, the catholic church yes and for the whole world, not for a small group of people according to race or anything else. After the baptism of this centurion, Peter will be interrogated. Things are not... There is a lot of argument going on. Things have not been settled and he is interrogated. And he will have to explain what he has done and why he has done it and, 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 and all the rest of it. He expresses that it is the order from God. Some, he explains it, some faithful accept it and they're no longer so alarmed. But it is going, this issue is going to come up again and again and again. 
Um, the point is that this this group, the particularist faction, the Jewish Christian, as it were, who emphasized race as a distinguishing mark, they are not really going to um, renounce that the supremacy of Israel easily. They're going to be quite upset about what Peter has done. As, as a matter of fact, they're going to be quite <laughs> up in arms. But they're going to be willing to forget this incident with Cornelius as an exception. Now enter the Apostle Paul, who has uh, made uh, four very, very long journeys. But he comes, uh, okay, Paul, he was from Tarsus in Cilicia, it's now Turkey. But he was, that city had been given full Roman citizenship as a benefit. He was a Roman citizen. He he had double nationality, as a matter of fact. That is why when they come to uh, execute him, they cannot uh, crucify him because, as St. Peter, for example, because he was a Roman citizen and uh, crucifixion was for um, slaves or, or the worst possible criminals. So instead of that, he is he is taken outside the city and he's beheaded. Okay, so who 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 was he? Because he is the one who's going to enter into a terrible row with Peter. Um, I'll come back to that. And and uh, he's but he's traveling everywhere. He has this conversion. You remember on the road to Damascus, and uh, he's he's converting Gentiles all over the place. Uh, he, uh, as I said, he was born in, in Tarsus and he had a vocation from a very early age. He wanted to, to he wanted to be a rabbi. Um, the, uh, let me just, um, so he's, uh, he was going to go to Jerusalem to study sacred scripture at the school of the great Pharisee, the Gamaliel, the one who who talked about, don't worry, you know, don't don't get overheated here. It might be just some passing thing. Anyway, he was going to study under him, and uh, and he was really a very fervent uh, Pharisee. And he was very zealous about a uh, great persecutor of, of Christians. And it was when he was going to Damascus to persecute Christians that he had this vision. Uh, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? Okay, he had that conversion. So anyway, he's um, one last episode now that is, um, it, it's called, is the famous incident uh, in uh, an incident in Antioch, okay. So um, Paul came from all these journeys that he was doing, converting um, Gentiles, and he when he when he came to Antioch, he realized that people were still with this dispute about Gentiles or no Gentiles, okay. So he, he just couldn't believe it because he had been, you know, everywhere converting Gentiles. This was in the year 48 or so. So Paul had come back to Antioch from one of his journeys. And um, when they arrived, they were, they gathered together the church, him and his companion Barnabas. They gathered the church together and they uh, started recounting how much God had done for them and they had opened the doors of the faith to the Gentiles and converting pagans and 
they had been the Gentiles of Asia, for example, recently converted and, of course, had not been obligated to keep the observances of the old law, um, one of them circumcision for males, yes. And um, so they they couldn't understand why this, this uh, division and this controversy was still going on. They said, um, hold on. So they start, they're very surprised about this, uh, this, uh, as I said, this uh, controversy is still going on. And they said, how can you possibly ask, you know, the, the people of Asia to, to become Jewish first? They couldn't, they couldn't understand it. And this is when we are going to find this famous, uh, let me look at my notes, the famous episode in Antioch. Because um, here there is a horrific argument between Peter and Paul. Very strong argument with each other. They actually have a row. Why? Briefly. Uh, Peter, the first pope, had a sort of a, it was a little bit too diplomatic. He had a sort of a double position here. For example, if he was with Gentiles, he would behave like a Gentile and he would not necessarily follow, for example, the traditions about food or whatever. If he was with the Jewish converts, he would behave like you know, following all the traditions of the the Jewish religion. Um, Paul basically calls him uh, a hypocrite. Uh, this thing has to be defined. This this problem has to be sorted out. So he 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 you know accuse him of of, of having a, a certain duplicity here. What happens is that it's going to be defined. Peter is going to finally, uh, you know, decide um, and take a position. And so what happens now is that the word Christian appears now because they're going to now see that there is a separation from the old law on to the new one. In other words, they're going to, they see themselves as becoming independent from the old religion. They're going to see themselves uh, not as a sect of the Jewish religion anymore, but of a new law and a new religion. This is major. Okay? They're no longer part of but something new. Um, Paul, coming from so many years of journeying and preaching and traveling, baptizing pagans, he is going to reproach him and make him finally decide, okay, face to face. And this is the famous incident of Antioch. You can see it, you can read it in the letter to the Galatians. Uh, and this is going eventually to bring about the first council of the church. The Pope Peter, together with the bishops, are going to define uh, this this uh, this topic two years after the Antioch incident the council of Jerusalem in the year 50 of the Christian era to actually find a solution once and for all for this issue what must we do what do we 
what do we have to do with pagans converting? Do they have to comply with Jewish law first or not? And that is decided. They don't. The answer is in the Acts 15. St. Peter says, Brothers, you've known for a long time that God chose me among you so that through my mouth the Gentiles might hear the words of the gospel and believe. And God, who knows our hearts, did not make any difference between them and us because he purified their hearts through the faith. Um, anyway, this is in Galatians, yes. This would be, so to speak, the first battle between the church and the synagogue. In Mark 16, go throughout the world baptizing all the people and teaching them what I have taught you. And that is what Peter referred to and he said that's it that is what he said full stop teach the whole of mankind what I have taught you he didn't add anything else this is going to be the uh, to signal the first the break of the Catholic Church with the old customs it will become even a greater division uh, in the following years. So then we are going to also see the martyrdom of James. James it's, it goes by James the Lesser or James the Minor, not James the Apostle, but another James, the Bishop of Jerusalem. Of course, Peter had been the bishop there but now he's going to Rome and he leaves James there for the church in Jerusalem as the bishop um, uh, so so Peter goes to Rome uh, he uh, James is going to be in charge of the community in Jerusalem and from there, he's going to write a splendid, wonderful epistle to the 12 tribes of the Christian diaspora, all those in, uh, initially Jewish, but dispersed, okay, throughout, the, you know, all that part of the world. The certainly the Jewish Christians who lived outside Judea. Uh, his continual preaching, this continual preaching of James, is actually going to um, upset the synagogue, and um, they're going to uh, actually punish him. And the high priest Anais, who is actually the son of the high priest who had who was there at the time of the crucifixion of Christ now his son is the high priest and he's going to order uh, to arrest him this is in the year 62 he is uh, he's going to be arrested James and he's going to come before the Sanhedrin and he is going to ask him directly to renege, to deny Christ. And since he doesn't, <clears throat> he was taken to the to the pinnacle of the the, the temple, the, all the way up, and uh, the highest part of of the temple. And from there, he will be thrown down. And since he didn't die straight away he will be then stoned to death and finally with a blow to his head. This is the martyrdom of uh, St. James, the lesser St. James the Minor, the Bishop of Jerusalem. Of Paul's travels, we are not uh, going to say a lot because his, his travels uh, four huge ones. Imagine the, the times. He's always going somewhere. <clears throat> the first took place between the years 
44 to 47 and he is going with uh, Saint Barnabas and also with Mark Saint Mark the evangelist and they are going to go to Asia Minor now Turkey he was absolutely tireless when when you actually think of the times the second journey will be between 51 and 53 and he will go again to Asia Minor to Macedonia to Greece Barnabas will now separate and he will go to Cyprus St. Paul will go to Athens and there the main discourse that I told you about in the first video um, and uh, just you know um, using those what we said semina verbi the seeds of the word that had been more or less planted there um, and he will get some everybody goes away because uh, you know the resurrection bit doesn't go down very well but he does he does there are some people who convert one of them Dionysius the Arapagite and a woman called Damaris some uh, he had some co converts um the uh, and there was a second one but anyway the last journey that he he did obviously was to Rome and he was going to appeal to Caesar before his condemnation to death uh, brought about by the Jewish people he will be executed in Rome but um, as I said he could not be crucified because he was a Roman citizen so um, they decapitated, beheaded him uh, outside and there is in that place where he was um, uh, killed there is now a church uh, it was uh, it's called San Paolo alle tre fontane uh, of, of uh, Saint Paul uh, at the three fountains why three fountains well because as his head fell down on the ground it bounced three times and we're told that three gushes of water from the rocks um, came forth, uh, springs of water came came forth, and they were still there in um, until 1950. I believe they still are, but they capped them, put some glass over them. Um, You know, in in some in some uh, readings, uh, they say, well, the water was always there. There used to be baths before that. Um, whatever, you know. It's uh, the fact is that there were people there, and all of a sudden, this water, three um, springs of water came forth. The church is there at any rate. Also, there is um, another story that. Uh, they were uh, they were going to persecute uh, obviously peter and uh, um uh, crucify him and he tried to escape and in his journey as he was running away peter as usual <laughs> uh, the story of Quo Vadis, where are you going yes he saw christ um, and he said domine my lord Vadis, where are you going? And in this vision, Christ said, I'm going to Rome to be crucified again. Anyway, Peter decided that he had to, he couldn't run away. He had to go back to Rome and face martyrdom especially as so many people so many christians were being martyred anyway it was not for him to run away and he went back and of course he was crucified and he asked to be crucified upside down because he didn't want to be crucified in the same manner as the lord so when you see uh, you know the uh, the the uh, drawings and the paintings of peter is always sort of upside down uh, from the political uh, point of view, um, 
let's see what happened to to the Jews. Uh, um, from the political point of view, Judea and Samaria form part of a Roman province. Yes, um, at the time of our Lord, the governor was Pontius Pilate. But Galilee in the north, when Christ was still living, was governed by Herod. After Pilate, there would still be two more governors or procurators who were f very fierce against the Jews. One was called Albinus. This is in, this, in the year 62 and 64. The other one, the next one, was called Florus between the years 64 and 66. They were very harsh, and th the Jews were also fighting back. To each Roman reprisal, there followed new Jewish outbreaks. But in the year 66, this combat and this struggle, you know, back and forth, was going to become much more more heated than usual. The Emperor Gallo ordered a repression, uh, mainly of these they were seen as Jewish nationalists. And these Jewish nationalists, these continuous uprisings, these people are called the Silots. The Silots were a Jewish political party in the first century, yes, that's where we are, who were known for their uncompromising opposition to the Roman Empire and their role in the Jewish-Roman wars. The um, I'm reading here from Britannica. The Silots uh, took a leading role in the first Jewish-Roman war between 66 and 73, as they objected to Roman rule and violently sought to eradicate it by indiscriminately attacking Romans and Greeks. Um, now, uh, in order to quell this, this uh, sedition in the eyes of the Romans, the emperor is going to send 12 Roman legions each legion actually had more or less about 6,000 soldiers, and he's sending 12 legions to quell this, this rebellion of the people of Israel. And he is actually going to go into the holy city, Jerusalem, um, but he is repelled from there. They were, they were fighting back, the Jews. The Christian community at the time which was mainly Jews who had converted. The Christian community at this time, this is about the year 70, they actually, instead of fighting, they chose to withdraw. Um, they're going to go to mainly the Transjordan zone. This Transjordania is a region in the southern Levant located east of the Jordan River. It is also known as today the East Bank or the Transjordanian Highlands, but most of it is still in part of uh, Jordan. Now, because they withdrew to these other parts, this was equivalent to almost not showing solidarity with the Jews. This was going to be a further separation. This physical gesture of leaving the Holy Land perhaps might not mean on the surface too much today. But for a Jewish Christian of that time, that was a huge decision. The holy city is the holy city, is the place of the temple. It's there, the prophets, Solomon, David. 
and leaving that land implied not only physically going away, but if you can imagine, I am actually definitely cutting myself off now from that cosmovision of the Jewish world. It was now a definite rupture, a definite break from the old tradition to the new for all those Christians that had come from Judaism. But above all, what the Jewish Christians, these Christians, are going to remember is that prophecy by Christ. And this is in Matthew 24. Let me read it to you. Because... And Jesus, being come out of the temple, went away, and his disciples came to show him the buildings of the temple. And he, answering, said to them, Do you see all these things? Amen, amen, I say to you, there shall not be left here a stone upon a stone, that shall not be destroyed. Within a generation, he told them. And when he was sitting on Mount Olivet, the disciples came to him privately, saying, Tell us when shall these things be? And what shall be the sign of that, of uh, thy coming and of the consummation of the world. And Jesus answering said to them, Take heed that no man seduce you, for many will come in my name, saying, I am Christ, and they will seduce many. And you shall hear of wars and rumors of wars. See that ye be not troubled. For these things might come to pass, but the end is not yet. For nation shall rise against nation, and kingdom against kingdom, and there shall be pestilences and famines and earthquakes in places. Now all these are the beginnings of sorrows. Then shall they deliver you up to be afflicted, and shall put you to death and you shall be hated by all nations for my name's sake. And then shall many be scandalized, and shall betray one another, and shall hate one another. And many false prophets shall rise, and shall seduce many. And because iniquity hath abounded, the charity of many shall grow cold. But he that shall persevere to the end he shall be saved. And this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in the whole world for a testimony to all nations, and then shall the consummation come. When, therefore, you shall see the abomination of desolation, which was spoken of by Daniel the prophet, standing in the holy place, he that readeth, let him understand. Then they that are in Judea, let them flee to the mountains. And he that is on the housetop, let him not come down to take anything out of his house. And he that is in the field, let him not go back to take his coat. And woe to them that are with child, and that give suck in those days. But pray that your flight be not in the winter or in the Sabbath. He goes on. But um, it's, a long, it's a long chapter. But in other words, um, leave. They read it carefully and they took comfort. In, in that um, because 
the separation now was practically done with them going away and leaving the Jews there to fight the Romans. This was in the year uh, 67. In the year 67, Nero, the emperor, is going to order the general Vespasian or Vespasian, I'm going to say Vespasian, to punish the rebels. Uh, he's going to send 70,000 men, although he's not going to succeed, actually, this time either, submitting them. And he is going to devise a plan, Vespasian is, known in the history of Rome as the open siege of Vespasian. Vespasian. Vespasian is going to surround Jerusalem, leaving an opening for whoever wants to leave. The people there can leave, but no one can come in. As the Russians did uh, at the beginning of the war, they would get the, uh, what, what is it, the, you know, they would encircle them and leave a little bit so that people would leave, the civilians would leave. This is called the open siege of the Spasium. Uh, and this open siege is the one, the open earth, uh, that many of these first Christians are going to use to go away. Um, in other words, they're going to take advantage of this and escape the Holy Land. And so in the massacre that's going to happen in the year 70, there were almost no Christians there. After Nero's death, his three successors, uh, Galba, Otto and Vitellius, three emperors. But after them, that general Vespasian, the one who's fighting, who was fighting a few years ago, he is the one that is going to become the emperor of Rome. So, um, the same person who had openly, directly fought against the Jews was now is now the Emperor of Rome. And who is going to take his place there? His son, General Titus. Now, we have to follow Josephus here. As I said to you, he is a Jewish historian, he was living alive at the time. Uh, I don't know why, because I don't know enough about it. I read that uh, some people um, see him as a traitor to the Jews. He he was he he was never a Christian. He writes about the destruction of the temple. I don't know enough about him or why they call him a traitor. There is a, there is a, um, although it's controversial. No one, n not everybody agrees with that. But there is a certain feeling that you get when you read him, when he's talking very specifically and in in great detail about the destruction of the temple, that you have a feeling that he's he's saying that this was a punishment from God. And there might be something there that, um, you know, that people don't agree with, something like that. <clears throat> but in any case, we're going to follow. There is so much material on this that you have to sort of choose one or the other. And since he was Jewish, um, let's see what he says. So, <clears throat> as I said, he's... Um, He's writing at the time, um, this book, The War of the Jews, or The Jewish War. He says, the permanent sacrifice in honor of God had been interrupted for lack in the temple for lack of men because of the war against the Romans. Because of these, the people were profoundly dismayed. Then General Titus once again 
warned John, the head of the Jewish resistance, that if he wanted to persist in his criminal madness of continuing to fight, he was willing to, of course, fight, but they would have to do it outside the walls with whomever he wanted to continue to fight, but without uh, involving uh, in it the destruction of the city and the destruction of the temple. At first, he didn't particularly want to destroy the city or to destroy the temple. Remember what we said in the first video, that the Romans, as they conquered territories, they had not really a problem with their gods. In fact, they brought their gods to the pantheon there. Oh, you have a god. They, they had no problem with that, with that, actually. So they didn't have a problem with the Jews having their religion. Um, they also had a sense uh, of, because of the Greek legacy, they have a sense of beauty. He didn't, he wasn't a Jew, so, but he didn't particularly want to destroy that temple because it was a, you know, a wonder of the world, practically. It was beautiful with golden ceilings and everything. He, he didn't, he didn't go specifically to destroy it. That is what Josephus says. And I suppose that people think that he was taking this, the side of the Romans or something like that. But he said, look, let's fight. Okay, let's fight. But let's do it outside the city and, you know, away from the temple. All right. So, um, okay, so... Um, Okay, Titus, knowing that Solomon's temple was so beautiful with golden ceilings, kind of wonder of the world, he didn't particularly want to destroy that. In that way, continues Josephus, he would avoid desecrating, he wanted to avoid desecrating the sanctuary and offend their God. And even they... Could con so that they could even continue to perform the sacrifices with the intervention of the Jews that he, the head of the resistance, that he who was he would name. So you name the, you know, whoever is, is going to continue doing your exercises, your sacrifices. I will allow all that. All I want is to fight you, but outside. Let's fight for sure, but let's do it outside the city. He tried, Titus, not only in giving clear orders not to burn down the sanctuary, but use the siege weapons, he actually says machines, the, the machines, to undermine the second, he says, the secondary elements of the construction, trying to cause the sacred building as little damage as possible. Finally, Titus, finding no other way out, decided to give the order to set fire because the, the, um, the resistance would not compromise on that. No, they wanted to fight there. So finally, Titus, perhaps in desperation, gives the order to set fire to the outer doors of the atriums that were covered in silver. But then the fire extended rapidly, enveloping the porticos in a sea of flames. This is Josephus' writing. Although, uh, although, it, uh, an, an, uh, external, although it was an external attack, not inside the temple, temple was not burning. It was burning sort of the doors outside. Nevertheless, the psychological impact was tremendous. Bear in mind, uh, this is uh, not Josephus, bear in mind that for a Jew, the temple was indestructible. The temple was the place where God lived. 
the temple was to last until the end of time. Uh, you remember before um, attacking uh, Je before when when attacking Jesus, misunderstanding what Jesus had said, they would say that the the, the Jews would say to him, "How can you talk about destroying the temple?" Uh, misunderstanding what what he was saying, but how can you talk about destroying the temple and saying that you will build it in three days? It took forever to build it. Uh, the Jews continued Josephus were left with no strength or courage due to their amazement at the burnt doors, and no one moved to put out the fire, remaining petrified with fear. An entire world was dying. The ultimate responsibility of the destruction of the sacred monument would be the responsibility of the Jews themselves, because they did not leave aside their position. In other words, they didn't compromise. The fire broke out and spread during the whole day and night. Uh, 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 during the whole day and the night that followed, although um, the next day, uh, sorry, I'm not reading this well, uh, the fire broke out and spread during the whole day and night. And the next day, Titus ordered to put the flames out and open a breach in the direction of the doors. Titus decided that if the Jews took positions in the temple to continue the resistance, it would be necessary to use anything against against things instead of against men. Not quite following this. But under no circumstances would that magnificent construction be handed over to the flames. So, reassured by such arguments, even the officers with dissenting opinions approved what he said. Uh, and uh, approved the opinion of their commander, who ended the meeting, ordered for the for 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 the temple to be spared, as it were, ordered the commanders to give rest to all their men so that they could be be better prepared for the combat the next day. The soldiers chosen uh, a court were given the task of opening a path through the rubble to put the fire out. Titus seem, seems to be trying to save the temple. Sometimes you get the impression that Josephus is really considering this, as, as I said, as a punishment from God. The Jews, however, were chased into the temple, and then a soldier moved, he says, by some supernatural force without waiting for orders, as a matter of fact disobeying orders, actually threw a torch um, without, without waiting for orders and without showing any fear in committing such terrible action. A Roman soldier always obey orders. This one didn't. He took hold of a torch and, supported by one of his comrades, threw it through a golden window that overlooked the rooms near the sanctuary in the northern part. When the flames spread, the Jews burst into an overwhelming scream at that tragic moment, and without taking care of lives and gathering all their strength, they rushed to help because it was on the verge of being destroyed, uh, what, uh, what they had always tried to save. Someone ran to tell the general, general Titus, who had previously retired to his tent to rest a while. He rose and half naked as he was, he 
uh, went towards it, ran towards the temple to try to control the fire. All his generals followed, and the legions followed them, causing great shouting and confusion. Titus gave the order to his combatants to put the fire out, but they would not hear him. My goodness. I think he means they did not listen. Something most unusual to a Roman not to obey an order would mean the death penalty. All right, so they they would not hear nor did they pay attention oh not to, not did they pay attention to the signals that he was making with his hands inflamed as they were in that fight carried away by frenzy to stop the momentum of the legionnaires who just they just went you know their demands and uh, threats did not serve because all let themselves be carried by fury. Trapped by a feeling of impotence, Titus, seeing that he could, rest he could not restrain the fury of the soldiers, and at the same time the fire was spreading inexorably, he himself went into the temple, followed by his generals, to see the sacred place and the object objects inside and since the flames had not reached the interior he thought that the monument could still be saved and hurriedly he got out and personally exhorted the soldiers to put out the fire ordering at the same time a centurion of his uh, personal guard to force anyone who did not obey to be to to be bitten <laughs> beaten <laughs> goodness suddenly they started taking out the trophies of war by the way there is a famous arch in rome which is very close to the Colosseum. it is called the arch of constantine which is very famous and you will see tourists there all day long taking photos um General uh, uh, Constantine, when he was a general, ordered it to be built after the Battle of the Milbian Bridge in the year 312. But the arch was built, that Constantine arch, I'm getting to the point, the, Const the, the Constantine arch was built as an adornment, you know, for the soldiers to pass underneath, you know, and, and, uh, and the emperor also. That is what Napoleon did also with the Arc de Triomphe, uh, you know, just, you know, to march there. It was, it was uh, uh, um, you know, uh, uh, prestige to, to, for the soldiers to go through the march. But the reason I'm saying this is that... Uh, a few meters further from that Constantine Bridge, beyond that arch, there is another arch that is almost like an entrance to the Roman Forum. If you come close, this is, and this is called the Arch of Titus. And no, no one actually, well, no one, is, no one goes to see that one. It's, uh, but it was built to show Titus' victory eventually. Titus ordered it to be built, and on the inside of the arch, you will see sculptured uh, engravings and sculptures uh, actually depicting how the war took place and you actually see engravings of people with the ark of the Com covenant and the uh, and the uh, uh, candelabra the seven uh, arm candelabra um it's it's actually quite beautiful anyway it's all sculptured there depicting how the war took place um so sometimes you will see a few people there. They they're Jews. 
and they go there and see it and it will not be unusual to see some people there crying the it's what remains uh, the memory that remains of the destruction of the temple in the year 70 um, okay let me just just a second anyway this was um, the year 70 and that was the destruction of the temple and uh, you know one goes back to Christ's prophecy not stone will remain upon stone within a generation he said uh, in the holy land now you see a certain reconstruction of the wall where the temple was it's a reconstruction um, from uh, actually now from from the year of, uh, 2000 uh, 9, uh, oh, 1948 okay when the state of Palestine was uh, founded uh, it was an attempt to reconstruct actually the temple at the very beginning um, in Jerusalem but anyway the synagogue now disappears the ancient Israel disappeared with the coming of Jesus Christ even physically after the year 70 the descendants of the tribe of Levi or Levi uh, also disappear there is no lineage um, so there can be no more sacrifices there are no more sacrifices in the Jewish world uh, they gather together in the synagogue uh, you know it's a sort of a liturgy the rite of the word but there are no sacrifices because there are no priests the priestly, priestly lineage was abolished because there are no descendants now Julian and another emperor it's uh, gone down in history as Julian the apostate he was originally Christian but then he uh, went into apostasy and actually um, very much an enemy of the church so uh, when he became emperor some years later well some years later actually uh, two, two cent uh, after the Emperor Constantine in the year 360 that's right is going to try to rebuild the temple um, that's Julian the apostate not to favor the Jews necessarily but to prove to Christians that the destruction was uh, that the was the sign of the old conf covenant at the beginning um, sorry I'm not saying this way uh, that in other words the what Christ had said that that there, there would be a new beginning that that had not been the end but there were and he tried but there were many sort of kind of mysterious events that made it impossible they couldn't go on they started but they couldn't go on he actually put great wealth at the disposal of uh, and materials at the disposal of architecture and archi architects and workers and anything they needed in order to start building the construction 
Thousands of workers were brought in, including many Jewish volunteers. But um, Bishop Cyril um, issued a challenge announce, announcing to the Christian community that it was going to be absolutely impossible for the Jews to carry out this purpose because the prophecy said that there would be no stone over a stone left within that generation. But in any case, they did try to start rebuilding it. And after the, uh, the, the end of the day, uh, <clears throat> when the reconstruction had started, at the end of the day, there were great, it is reported by historians, great seismic movements that shocked the esplanade there, the, 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 where, where the workers were working, uh, and most of them were buried under the rubble. Perhaps the most impressive fact related by uh, Ammanias, a personal envoy of the emperor, he had sent him uh, uh, to, to inform him, to relate back to him about how the architectural and the construction work was being carried out. And his official testimony to the emperor, Julian, was the following. Gigantic spheres of flames fell in waves on the foundations and made that place inaccessible. And as the physical elements constantly pushed the workers back, the work had to be interrupted. This is the chronicler to, to, uh, to the emperor. Later, in the 8th century, there would be the Arab invasion that will turn that esplanade of the temple into one of the most sacred places in Islam, which is there now. I'm not going to touch this because... Um, all right. So... Um, they had tried to rebuild it and it wasn't possible and I don't think it has been tried ever since. So, it's all rather sad really, but um, there you go. Josephus seems to suggest that, don't want to put words into his mouth, but he seems to suggest that had the uh, silots, the, the, um, the, 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 you know, the party, the political party that was continuously fighting the Romans and so on, had they been perhaps a little bit more cool-headed and being able to compromise a little bit, perhaps it wouldn't have happened. This is, but he's not obviously... Uh, he didn't know about the prophecy, but uh, he seems to suggest that it could have been avoided had they been a little bit more reasonable in that Titus actually gave them quite a few opportunities to fight, but let's, let's keep the temple out of it. And um, anyway, I, I don't know. I don't know. But anyway, okay, so um, this is the second one, and I hope he has some, oh my goodness, well, not as long as the first one, thank God. All right, I'll see you next time. Bye-bye.